Hi, I'm here today with Executive Chairman of Encore Energy, Bill Sheriff. We're going to be discussing the worldwide energy crisis and what experts are saying is the most viable long-term solution. Bill, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, can we start off just with a little bit of your background? Sure. Uh, William Sheriff, Executive Chairman of Encore Energy. Uh, company's been around for a decade. I've been involved in the industry since 1986. Okay. Uh, with public companies in the industry since uh, around the year 2000. Uh, started Energy Metals Corp uh, with uh, co-founder Paul Matissek in 2004, uh, where we put together the uh, U.S.'s largest uh, uranium resource in the history of the country and uh, developed it rapidly during that boom period. Uh, ended up selling out to Uranium One for $1.8 billion in 2007. Uh, stayed with Uranium One for uh, a period of time on their board before uh, leaving to uh, go on to start uh, what was uh, eventually become Encore. With the development of the Russia-Ukraine war, um, we seem to have highlighted a looming global energy crisis. Where do you see this development and how does it impact the domestic energy sector? It's a great question. It really has impacted it in several ways. I think the most immediate effect is uh, actually in other sources, such as natural gas, going directly from Europe in, uh, going from Russia directly into Europe. Uh, and the energy chain is so interlinked that you know you get pressure on one end, you get pressure on another. And uh, I don't think it's really had a, much of an immediate impact on uh, the nuclear industry, but it certainly has the potential to create a huge impact because the Western world is largely dependent upon Russian uranium or uranium that goes through Russia. They have uh, an inordinate amount of the uh, enrichment and conversion, which are both aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle. They've got the, the stranglehold on that. And uh, there's about a 70 million pound a year imbalance between what we produce from new sources and how much we burn or consume in the market every year. Of that, about two thirds of it comes through the port of St. Petersburg. It's on the balance, and should the EU, as the parliament has voted, uh, to sanction Russian uh, nuclear industry, uh, or if uh, Mr. Putin should decide to uh, cut off the West, we have a significant issue, and it will uh, develop into a crisis quickly. But aside from that, we have a very steady growth uh, outlook in the nuclear business, and that's why we're in it. Can we talk a little bit more about where nuclear energy fits into the domestic energy supply? Sure, and uh, when we say domestic, uh, our, our, we're 100% uh, focused in the U.S., so I'm going to give it to you from the U.S. viewpoint. Uh, the U.S. is the world's largest consumer of nuclear power uh, through electric utilities. Uh, last year we burnt 47 million pounds of uranium and we produced roughly 100,000 pounds, which was through byproduct, pr byproduct production. So essentially we produced nothing, and 47 million pounds being the largest consumer, you can see some p possible issues developing there. Uranium is necessary to produce nuclear energy. Um, where does the supply come from going forward? Well, it's an interesting question. Prior to the Cold War, the U.S. was self-sufficient in uranium. And then like so many other industries, pharmaceuticals, uh, almost any industry you can think of, we became hooked on cheap imports. You know, nuclear energy is developed. Uh, you can obviously uh, buy it elsewhere cheaper. China's now consuming for as much of it as they can possibly get and winning the competition. Canada still is a huge producer. Most of that's through Cameco, and it's all contracted. The uh, spot market of uh, uranium gets the headlines. What's it doing today? Well, many times the spot market uh, moves and fluctuates simply on a bid and ask without a transaction occurring. It's a very thin market. It's all contract driven. So most of that Canadian supply, uh, most of the Australian supply is dominated by long-term contracts. And uh, most of the uranium coming out of uh, you know, the east is, is dominated, Kazakhstan being the world's largest producer. Most of that's dominated by contracts as well, but it goes through St. Petersburg. So while only a third of that is Russian origin, two thirds of it comes through their port and so they actually have control over it. Can you explain the uranium sector and how it's developed you know, over the past four decades and give a little bit of an overview on that and um, maybe highlight the, the difference between now and what we saw in 2004 and 2007? Yeah, sure. Uh, the nuclear industry obviously started out of the military applications. Period of a decade, it, it uh, shifted from the uh, atomic arms race, which is still a factor, um, but mostly into peaceful use. And you see that in the uh, nuclear utilities. One of the misnomers is people think that the radioactivity uh, associated with uranium actually is, the radiation is what makes the electricity. All it does is create a heat source to uh, uh, turn steam, steam turbines. 
that essentially replaces coal or natural gas in the process. And we've seen that grow uh, steadily through 1979. 1979, we'll have Three Mile Island, which was the first uh, miniature incident, I, I would say, uh, and uh, you know, alarmist from the media view. What could go wrong? Something could go wrong. And so that really put a damper. At that time, there were plans to grow 300 nuclear reactors in the U.S., uh, you know, thousands global, globally, and those plans just basically came to a, a, an abrupt halt. And then we've struggled through since then, and then, uh, you know, there have been a couple of major incidents, Chernobyl being the only really truly significant disaster. But that was a, an early stage Soviet design where they bypassed uh, all the safety features and increased the production capability past its rating. It was a, you know, generation two reactor. We're, we're working at generation fives now with, you know, infinite uh, uh, redundancy on safety and safety features. So you, know, you aren't going to see that. I'm not going to say you won't see an incident, but you aren't going to see that type of disaster again. One of the other big differences, and this is all based on the conventional reactor, but one of the new, new things are the small modular reactors that I'm sure you've heard of. Much smaller factory design, so you see a bit of uh, Henry Ford's automation uh, or production line meeting the atomic age, which is probably overdue. But it's going to make it a lot more commonplace every day. Um, the smaller size, obviously, is quicker, cheaper, standardized design. Because the simple answer is without nuclear power, you cannot get to uh, carbon conscious electricity. There just simply are not enough uh, windmills or solar cells or places to put them. The wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. What about that boom in 2004, 2007, if you wanted to touch on that a little that bit? Was yeah. a, and, and you know, thank you for asking because that's the uh, time frame in the market that most of our investors recall. It's really been the only significant boom since Three Mile Island back in you know, 1979. And what happened there was not uh, typical and not uh, terribly related to what's going on now at all. That was a crisis of, of supply or a faith in supply. Keep in mind everything's contract generated or almost everything, uh, long-term contracts. In that time frame when MacArthur River flooded, being Canada's biggest mine and highest grade, uh, it flooded. Then shortly on the heels of that, we had Ranger in Australia, which is a large open pit by ERA. That flooded due to monsoons. Meanwhile, they're trying to bring Cigar Lake, the next big mine in Canada, up. It floods. Within four months, it floods again. And so we had a real crisis of supply. This was all set against a backdrop of static demand. And in fact, we were still uh, opposed by a very large uh, contingent of the population as nuclear energy. And uh, certainly the environmentalists weren't in favor of it. Now we see because of the carbon uh, and, and the green energy, we actually have found most of our former uh, opponents are now advocates to one degree or another. And so it'll be very different. Last time we had this huge spike uh, from basically 10 or $20 to 140 but that's because the utilities were scrambling because their supplies were threatened. You can always call force majeure on a contract if your mine floods. And uh, as a result, as soon as three or four of these events happen, you see the momentum changing. Then the financial players, the hedge funds decide, ah, oh, let's get into the market and play. So they smell blood in the water for the lack of a better term and uh, exacerbated what was already a big move into a truly gigantic move. None of those factors are in play today with the possible exception of the Ukrainian situation if Russia were to cut us off or vice versa. And that could cause a similar spike, although uh, in my view, probably not quite as great a magnitude. Uh, but I think long term, we've got a sustainable industry for the first time since the, the late 70s. And we're looking at decades of uh, very promising above average demand pull between conventional reactors and small modular reactors. So it's going to be a very exciting time. We're seeing entire portfolio switching over to ESG focused companies, you know, in this industry. Um, how does nuclear energy and uranium fit into that ESG landscape? Well, nuclear energy is really quite, quite green. Uh, when you compare our emissions, which are essentially zero to, to virtually any other form of energy, our uh, worker safety index as well is competitive with only solar. Everything else is far more dangerous industry to work in. In fact, working in the coal industry is three or four orders of magnitude more dangerous than the nuclear industry. We're very ESG compliant just by the nature of our business. And uh, once you get into uranium, we're even more so by virtue of the fact that we aren't really a mining company. We don't dig open pits, we don't dig undergrounds, we don't have a conventional mill, we don't have tailings facilities. We actually inject oxygenated groundwater into the ground through a series of pumps, and, and we do drill a lot of holes, injection wells, and then we dissolve the uranium pump it to the surface, run it through a plant, do ion exchange, much as an industrial uh, water treatment plant, then refortify the water with oxygen and repeat the process. So we're essentially non-invasive. 
Why should an investor invest in uranium? Like, you know, we have obviously all these like other commodities out there and what makes uranium so attractive? Well, I think energy is what runs everything. Okay. And, uh, you know, even, even so much as to the point of uh, lithium and the batteries and the revolutionizing of that into the industry. Without the power grid, those batteries are of no use. Uh, so you have to have power. Everything starts with power and energy. And uh, being at the cornerstone of that, and especially on the environmentally friendly side of that, after decades of, of your more conventional fuels, uh, it's clearly a choice of the future. Will it be surpassed or surrupt somewhere in the future by fusion or, or hydrogen? Uh, probably, but we're decades away from fusion being commercially practical. So what do we do in the meantime? You know, in fact, in Europe, when they've been cutting down in the past some of these nuclear reactors, which fortunately has been now reversed, they're actually going to diesel generation. So probably not a great answer to a probably overstated issue. So we're seeing most of the countries now actually expanding, prolonging, extending life of reactors, extending the capacity of them, their operational output rating. Uh, so it's quite a quite an exciting time, and uh, like I say, it's best way to look at it is the growth plan we had going into the late 70s. There's been a 40-year hiatus, but we're back on track, and that is without the small modular reactors, which are really going to add significantly to that uh, to that profile. And where does uh, Encore fit into that? Encore is uh, the leader in the U.S. We focused in the U.S. for several reasons. Number one, of the global imbalance of supply, about 75% of that imbalance is in the U.S. The U.S. is still the world's largest consumer of nuclear power uh, for power plants. It may be uh, surpassed in the next decade by China, but uh, we just opened uh, Votal 3. Effectively, uh, the reactor went critical on Monday uh, this week, so it's a big, big uh, hallmark for a southern company. And one of our board members who actually helped design the nuclear uh, components there from the southern company. Uh, just showing we are still building nuclear reactors. They're, they're bigger, they're safer, they're, as I say, fifth generation. Uh, Votal 4 will come on later this year. A number of new reactors have been announced in the U.S., uh, as well as uh, you know, dozens of them around the world. Where do you see other develop, development in this sector to meet the growing demand? Clearly we are not alone. There are others in the industry. Um, we specialize, as I mentioned, in in situ. We, be, we believe it to be the uh, you know, greener of the choices, and, and certainly uh, I, I, I liken it to uh, non-invasive mining, because we're doing it all through wells. Uh, which are much easier to permit, shorter timeline because of that. Also, we don't use harsh chemicals. We inject oxygen or baking soda, that's all. Now, many of the countries that do uh, in situ, such as Kazakhstan, will inject acid, which is much harder to clean up. We'll leave it at that. Uh, but, but there's uh, four or five in the U.S. that are pursuing ISR. We have more than our fair share of talented uh, people that have been in the industry for 30 or 40 years. Our CEO has uh, built the last three or four projects. Uh, uh, that being Paul Gorenson, and another of our uh, board members, our chief technical officer, Dennis Stover, is actually one of the original two inventors of the process. So uh, in addition to the upper levels, we have 40 workers in the field that have actually operated in situ plants in the U.S. So we're, uh, I think, uh, ahead of the game or certainly leading the pack in terms of uh, revitalization. And with three of the licensed, uh, only 10 licensed plants in the U.S., two of which are ready to go, uh, I think we'll be clearly the leaders in the industry, and certainly in the U.S. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that you feel like we missed? I feel like we had a really pretty good overview there. Quite a lot to talk about, but I think really the key for investors is a bit of patience. We're into a much better, sustainable market than we've seen in literally 50 years. And uh, I think the future is very bright, but it's not that supply constraint crisis market that we saw in 05 to 08. And it's going to take a little bit, uh, little bit more patience. Uh, but you're going to see a good 6 to 8% a year industry growth, maybe the first few years even up around 10. And that's without factoring in the small modular reactors, which have the, the real potential and promise to really uh, double that, uh, that, that need. So uh, it's, uh, it's an exciting time uh, to be here. It's, it's kind of interesting with the automation meeting, the, the closing of the 50-year hiatus in, in nuclear growth, where we're really at the dawn of a, of a new era on it. So it's an exciting place to be. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much again. Thank you.